the Lord is good tonight. 1992, that was the first time that I came to Korea. I lived in Pohang for one month, enjoyed Ojinga and the beautiful beaches in Pohang, and then visited Busan and some other places. 1993, God returned me to Korea. This time, I was a student at Asia Yunhap Shinak Dehakyo. There you are, yeah. your school. Yeah. Now, in those days, there were not too many of us in those days. 1993, that was also the first time that I met a young pastor. And so we met through a friend, and I visited his work uh, ministry site <clears throat> and realized that we had a common vision, and that is to reach out to the Philippines first at the time, and then to other nations. <clears throat> I remember when I graduated from Acts, I received my PhD from Acts in 1996, Pastor Moon came to my graduation. Little did I know that when Justin graduated from high school, he would ask me, he said, Dr. Cassino, I could not come to the US. Would you please go, you and your wife, and attend Justin's graduation on our behalf? So we drove all the way from North Carolina to Kentucky and enjoyed Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> So, Pastor Moon, we, are, we don't have debts to one another now, so, so I, I paid back. <laughs> but that's how, that's how network works. The word network is a very beautiful thing because it actually means a web of relationships. Web of relationships, just like a spider making a web and interlinking all facets of life. Tonight's passage actually is about a huge network that Jesus has established for his disciples. And so we will find that in John chapter 20, uh, John chapter 20 beginning with verse 19 down to verse 23, Jesus would set up the largest, strongest, and most powerful network that the world has ever seen. He said, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. In one of the translations, it says, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. That established the largest and strongest and most powerful network that the world has ever seen. And this is the network of missions. That is why we are here. That is why even with so many years have passed, Pastor Moon and I continue to serve the Lord together. It is no joke that 30 years of partnership, getting stronger, continues today. That was a long time ago. As I said, a while ago, that was the time when my hair was thick and long, and now I long for hair. <laughs> so Jesus said, I'm going to send you. I'm going to send you. But I'm going to send you with the good news. I'm not going to send you empty. I'm going to send you with something in your hands. I'm going to send you with something in your hearts. And so he said, peace be to you. In other, words, in other words, if we are going to fulfill the missions network that God in Christ has given us, we need to start with peace. Are you with me? Say it with me, please. Peace. peace. That's the first thing that God gives us. So we are able to establish this missions network because of peace. Notice that he said this twice. 
two times in this passage. In a very short passage, he said, peace be to you. Peace be unto you. In other words, Jesus is saying that there is no way for us to serve God unless we receive this peace from God himself, right? There has to be peace with God first. There has to be reconciliation between you and God, between me and God, between us and God. That starts. So there is this peace with God, and then there is also this peace with one another. Do you know that in China, the first Two times that the, the, the missionaries, the foreign missionaries or Western missionaries were kicked out of the country was because of the lack of unity. The missionaries, the Jesuits, the Franciscans, and all kinds of these sections in the Catholic Church, they started fighting against each other. And so knowing that the emperor has to unify the nation, he decided to kick them out of the country. Why? For one reason. If the missionaries themselves who talk about Christ, if the missionaries themselves who talk about peace with God cannot unify, my empire would not be able to unify itself. And so they just, I mean, the emperor just kicked them out. It happened twice. The third time it happened was when the Communist Party took over, right? <clears throat> And the missionaries, of course, were also expelled from China. But what I'm trying to say here is this. Unless we have this reconciliation with God, and unless we have this reconciliation with one another, the world will not listen to our message. That's why we are here tonight. That's why we are here throughout this week. Why? Because we have this peace with God, and we have this peace with one another. Now, I have observed and participated in so many, so many forms of ministries in different parts of the world, in six countries. I have noticed one thing, that when God's people are not united, when God's people are not reconciled to one another, when God's people do not have this unity in the spirit of love, the message of the gospel has no value. Because we are supposed to be people of peace. Amen? Amen? But we need to have this peace with God first, reconciled with him first. And then we need to have this peace with one another. It doesn't mean that we always agree. That's not the point. Peace in Christ and peace with one another does not mean that we always agree. Believe me, we don't agree all the time with, you know, Pastor Moon. One time he said, you know, we were, we were in Nagaland. One time he said, you know, I feel guilty that we, we, we stay in a hotel. We're supposed to stay in a, like, you know, in a poor place during Mission Naga, where our backs would feel the pain of the hardwood, you know, things like those. I look at him, I said, Pastor Moon, if you get sick, what can you do? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So those are some of our, you know, uh, like uh, differences. But those differences do not take away the peace that we have with one another. We cried a lot. We laughed together. We ate together. We even slept together in Calcutta Airport. There was a hurricane. <laughs> our planes were grounded. We couldn't leave Calcutta. This was in 2019, I guess, November 2019, right, Salim? And so we had no choice. We slept on the floor of the airport. There were hundreds and hundreds of passengers stranded together. And yet, early in the morning, he woke me up. He said, doctor, let's go. I said, where? Let's, you know, just grab some cup of coffee, you know. That's what peace means with one another. The Bible says love one another. The Bible does not say like one another. There are times when you don't like me. And there are times when I don't like you. But it doesn't mean that my love for you and your love for me should diminish. That is exactly why we need this peace. No wonder Jesus said, peace unto you. He just got resurrected, right? 
But then the very first word that came out of his lips was peace. He did not say, Anyangaseyo. He did not say, hello. He said, peace be unto you. That's so powerful. That's our message tonight. And that's the message that the world needs. I've been following these atrocities in Manipur and for some time now. And my heart pains and aches because of the lack of peace in that part of the world. But then peace does not come from pharmacy. We know that. You don't go to a pharmacy and buy peace, right? But peace comes from Christ alone. In fact, in the Hebrew uh, uh, interpretation, the word peace is related to the word the kingdom of God. In other words, in other words, there is no peace unless the kingdom of God comes on earth. There's no peace unless the kingdom of God comes on you. And there's no peace unless the kingdom of God comes on our networks, on our family. Peace reigns when we let the kingdom of God control our lives. But then Jesus said, and he said that he breathed the spirit of God on them, received the spirit. So you see, when peace is established, there is power. Are you with me? From peace to power. That's what we need. Jesus said, receive the spirit. And he breathed the spirit on them. There are two sides to this power. The first side is power for holy living. Jesus knew that the disciples would fail sometimes. Jesus knew that the disciples would have difficulty living the kind of life that God wants them, wants them to live. So Jesus gave them this power. Because without this power, we cannot live a life that is holy. Without this power, we cannot live the kind of life that God wants us to live. No matter how we try, no matter how good we are in trying to please God, without this power, we cannot, we cannot accomplish things for his glory. So Jesus said, receive this, the Holy Spirit. But then this power is not just power for living. This power is also for power for service. Amen? So holy living first, because the Bible says, be holy, for I am holy. And then power for service. Now, we can, we can have all this training, right? We can have all the degrees in our lives. We can have all this high education. We can have attended, you know, I mean, we, we, we can actually attend all kinds of training and conferences in our lives. But without power, the strategies that we do and create actually are nothing in front of God's eyes. So God has to give us this power to serve him. The technology that we use, that's important, of course, right? Like this one right now. You see, when my voice goes into that camera, my voice becomes golden. I'm not sure about that, Muxanim, okay? <laughs> Because I have cold. <laughs> but technology, you know, we use technology. And, and there are many th good things about technology. The word technology is actually <laughs> important. It means technique for life. But then we become slaves to technology sometimes. Rather than using technology as a technique for our life. It is the power of God that makes the difference. It is the power of God that makes the difference. We serve God with this power. And so we need to search this power. Or we need to ask God to give us this power moment by moment. Not one day, not two days, not three days, not four days. But every moment in our lives should be full of the Spirit's power. Amen? It means we have to rely on this power so that we can accomplish things for his glory. So you see, we have this peace that produces power, and there is another thing. What did Jesus say next? He said, forgive. Did you see that one? 
He said, forgive. Forgiveness is a result of the power of God. Now, my wife has started actually talking about this this afternoon, and I was praying, please don't expound more because <laughs> that's my message. Don't steal this message, okay? <laughs> but Jesus said, Jesus said, let's take a look at, the, uh, at this. He said, if you forgive you, uh, men their sins, God will forgive them, right? Mm. Now, we all know, my wife has already noted this, you know, uh, I, um, one of the things that I really try to avoid is when I speak after my wife, because I'm afraid that probably some of the things that I'm going to say, she's going to say first. <laughs> and so you, you will find that, you know, prayer and forgiveness go hand in hand. We all know this. When Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, he actually, uh, before he ended this prayer, he actually explained it to them that pray like this. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sinned against us, who trespass against us, right? Did you notice that in verse 14 and verse 15, Jesus explained it more in Matthew chapter 6? He expanded it and he said, if you forgive men their sins, your Father in heaven will forgive them. But if you don't forgive them their sins, your Father in heaven will not forgive you. You see, you can pray loud. You can shout hallelujah. You can actually jump up and down praising God. And if there is somebody in your heart whom you have not forgiven, your prayer has no spiritual value. I'll guarantee you that. No matter how you shout, no matter how you cry, no matter how you tremble before God and say, Lord, Lord, but if there is somebody in your heart whom you have not forgiven, that prayer bounces like a ball, <laughs> like this. It has no spiritual value. Try it. Try not forgiving somebody and pray to God. Try how hypocritical you can be. Because somebody who claims to be a child of God, somebody who claims to be a missionary of God, somebody who claims to be a servant of God, praying to God and not forgiving his brother who sinned against him or his sister who sinned against him or his child who sinned against him or her. That prayer has no spiritual value. But there's another thing here. Forgiveness without prayer is manipulation. Are you with me? It's simply psychology, not biblical theology. So you can forgive without prayer, right? And then you feel good, ah, I have forgiven you. But if you don't pray for that person, that is only psychology, not theology. So you see, it's very important for us to understand that the heart of the message of the good news is forgiveness. In fact, before Jesus ascended to heaven, you remember in, on, um, he, he told his disciples in Luke chapter 24 that repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed among the nations. Sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we think of missions as social work. Sometimes we think of missions only as social justice. Sometimes we think of missions only as feeding, you know, those who are hungry. Neglecting the point that Jesus said, it's really about repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Because unless people come to God in repentance, unless you and I come to God in repentance, we'll not be able to experience forgiveness. That's the heart of the gospel. Amen? Amen? That's why we leaders, we need to come to God moment by moment and say to God, Lord, what is in my heart that offends you? Who is in my heart that offends my relationship with you? So it could be that there's somebody in your heart tonight who actually is still in jail, a spiritual jail because you have not released that person 
And believe me, if you claim yourself to be a child of God, if you claim yourself to be a missionary of God, you need to learn how to release that person. Forgiveness is the key to the kingdom of God. You remember Peter? Upon this rock, I will build my church. Whoever you forgive, I will forgive. The key to the kingdom of God is forgiveness. No more, no less. That's our mes message tonight. That's why we are here. And I know, I know this, uh, you know, I always share this experience and probably uh, my wife has heard this uh, story many, many times. My family, I have, I have a big family. I have six brothers and four sisters. And so my, 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 my mother, when she was young, fell in love with somebody uh, from our town. And they were so young. My mother comes from a landed family. In other words, they had huge property. <laughs> and so uh, her father had big dreams for her. But one day she fell in love with my future father. And then they ran away. <laughs> they eloped without asking permission from their parents. That became an issue. My grandfather, mother's father, got so angry that he cursed my mother. And he said, from this day on, you're no longer my daughter. You're no longer my child. And you know what he did? Because he came from a Spanish family. He went to one of his farms and planted a bamboo. And he said, as long as the bamboo leaves, I will never forgive my daughter. So he cursed my mom. He cursed my dad. He cursed the entire family, including myself. And I remember when I was 10 years old, I met my grandfather for the first time. For the first time. And in the Philippines, you know, if you... If you meet your elder, you have to kiss the hand of the elder. Moksanin, please. Yeah. Come. Yeah. You become my elder today, although I am older than you. Yeah. So, you, and then you do like this. So, that's exactly what I did to my, to my grandfather. I was so excited. I saw my grandfather for the first time. I was 10 years old. I was so young. I grabbed his hand and kiss it. We call it kiss, but actually put it in my, on our forehead. And then he smiled at me and he said, who are you? I said, my name is Terry. And I said, who is your mother? I said, my mother is, you know, I mentioned my mother's name. And then the moment that I mentioned my mother's name, he withdrew his hand like this. And I said, I don't have a daughter with that name. You just imagine you're 10 years old. You met your grandfather for the first time. And it was a very embarrassing and painful meeting with your grandfather. Now, I started asking questions. I said, what's going on? Why is it that grandpa is not even willing to, uh, to allow me to kiss his hand? And then I started knowing the story. Very painful, very painful. And so my grandpa did not give a share to my mom. It was very painful. So our family suffered so much economically. Ten kids. In fact, my family suffered so much that when I was five and a half years old, I was actually put in a different family. So growing up, I grew up with six, seven different families. I had so many mothers and fathers growing up. Can you imagine? After like a few years, you have another mom, then another mom, another dad. Six different families. That's how I grew up. In 1998, we had our first reunion as a family. Grandpa was long dead. But you know what happened? Why we were able to visit his 
uh, property again. Two of my brothers went to the farm with gasoline and poured gasoline into the bamboo and burned it down. <laughs> so the curse was gone. The curse was gone. And I remember, I remember when we came back from my father's property, we saw like vast lands. Even if you go to our city today, part of the land that is actually um, used by the international airport was owned by my grandfather. But then when we came home, some of us started crying because we saw how we, you know, as a family, how, how, how life was, became miserable for us, so difficult for us. It became so hard. We became so poor. And then my sister said this that I'll never forget in my life. She said, because of grandpa, our generation suffered. I'll never forget that. Because of one man who did not forgive, the next generation suffered. And if the bamboo continued to live today, probably the third, the second, the second, the third, and the fourth generation would continue to be cursed. And that's what happens to us. Because God has sent us to the world to proclaim peace to live with power and to forgive. If we are not able to forgive tonight, the next generation will suffer. That's the beginning of our revival. Unless we forgive, we'll never be able to let God revive our hearts tonight. Let me close with this illustration that I'll never forget. One of my students at the Baptist Seminary a long time ago told me about what happened to her. She attended a, woman, a women's conference one day, and on the last evening, the speaker asked them to close their eyes. And as they closed their eyes, the speaker said, I want you to pray that God would help you create a picture frame in your mind. And so they closed their eyes and then they created a picture frame, a photo frame. And then the speaker said, pray to God right now to put an image into that frame. That frame is empty, but ask God to put an image into that frame. And the person that would come to that frame first is the person whom you have not forgiven yet in your life. And so my friend closed her eyes and created a mental frame. And she prayed, Lord, who is this person whom I have not forgiven yet in my life? And the first person that came to the frame was her father, a famous pastor in my country. And she said she realized that growing up, she had so many resentments against her, uh, towards her father. Those resentments built up over the years, up to the time that she was not able to forgive. Do you know why we have difficulty forgiving? Because we look for justice rather than release mercy. Christians who are not able to forgive want justice. But God said, justice is mine, not yours. I give you mercy. So I pray tonight, I pray tonight that before this evening is over, before you go to bed, that you ask God to put those people whom you have not forgiven yet in that mental frame, picture frame in your life 
and forgive those people. Unless you want to be a hypocrite person. Don't leave this place without forgiving those people. It can be a child, it can be your daughter, it can be your son, it can be your pastor, it can be your best friend. It can be whoever who has actually brought pain to your life. Release those people. Peace, power, forgiveness. Our Father tonight, as we reflect on your word, may you deliver us from an unforgiving spirit. And thank you, Lord, for the power that you have given us. Because of this power, we are able to live the kind of life that you want us to live. And we're able to serve you. And we're able to forgive those whom we have not forgiven yet. Give us this heart of forgiveness and a heart of peace. And we ask all this in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for the wonderful work.